Hi, everyone. Welcome to uh, the Wirex Weekly Podcast, where we dive into engaging conversations with experts, thought leaders, and innovators. And I'm your host, Liana. Today, we're thrilled to have Eleonora Roca joining us. Eleonora is not only the co-founder of the Horizon Group, but also the founder and managing director of Women X Impact. Welcome, Eleonora. Thank you for taking the time to be here with us. Hi, thank you so much. Very happy to be here. Looking forward for our conversation. Yeah, today we're going to talk about a fascinating topic. Um, how is women's strength and unity shaping the future beyond boundaries? Uh, and this ties in perfectly with the theme of International Women's Day, Invest in Women, Accelerate Progress. But before we dive in, Eleonora, perhaps you could share with our listeners a little bit about your professional background and how you got to where you are today. Absolutely, absolutely. So I was born in Rome and then I lived in Milan for a while and then I moved to London 10 years ago. So I've been a little bit around. Then in terms of my background, I actually graduated in the law, but I decided to do marketing because that was my main passion. And then at some point of my career, uh, first, I worked uh, mainly in global corporations like Microsoft, Kings of Technology, TP Link, so global companies. But then at some point, I realized I enjoyed more the scale ups, the uh, entrepreneurial projects, so where I could uh, potentially create more and make a larger impact on my day to day job. So, this is how I came to create my first company, which I sold. I've done an exit in 2020 and then another one now including the Women for Impact project. But uh, important to know, um, to link to the topic that we are going to discuss today, is that Women for Impact actually was created and was born uh, from a very difficult time that I was having and from my personal negative, unfortunately, experience being a woman within the entrepreneurial world. And this is when I decided to start doing something. I said, I want to turn this, uh, let's say, negative experience into something positive. And what can I do? Maybe a community might be might be the right answer because I feel then that when you add up, let's say, network, network and training and, you know, improvement in general, I think uh, you can add more value in what you do every day and you can be more prepared as a woman to face certain difficulties and certain challenges. And hopefully we will have a future uh, where more and more women will become leaders because just, and then I close, it's important to say that, um, you know, women seem to arrive only at a certain stage of their career. So when it comes to being middle managers or senior managers, they tend to get to that point. But when it comes to, you know, kind of raising up to C-level positions or, you know, being CEOs and being leaders, then unfortunately statistics drop uh, massively. So this is why I said I want to create something that can help more and more women to get to that level. Yeah, that's really wonderful. And thank you so much for sharing your journey. Um, it's truly fascinating. And, you know, so let's dive in, right? Can you give us an overview of how things are looking for women's empowerment these days? So my point of view on this one is that we are not uh, in a completely bad stage because compared to the past, when I'm saying past, I'm saying even Compared to five years ago, for example, I feel there are more and more um, organizations, more and more programs as well, because I'm I'm working very closely with big companies like KPMG or Google or Amazon. I've been doing programs, running programs with them uh, during the past years. So I can see that even companies are becoming you know, more um, closer to this topic and actually acting in a positive way, meaning they do training internally, they try to avoid discrimination when it comes to interview stage, for example, recruiting stage, and also when it comes to promotion, kind of helping more and more women to um, not being held by, for example, maternity leave or, you know, situation that might might need their care in the family, and which doesn't necessarily mean as to be a soft 
negative thing uh, on, on the career. And I can see that compared to the past, this more and more, um, let's say, laws are coming into place, more and more new good practice and best practice and case studies are happening across the world and more and more organizations like Women for Impact uh, is one of, of the many others that, you know, have been built by women and are growing and growing. And this makes me think that we are in a good place and, uh, you know, step by step, we will get there. We know that it's going to take probably 15 to 20 years to get rid of the gap, of the gender gap completely. But I always say I'm a big uh, believer of, uh, you know, starting starting from something and uh, and going from there. If you never start, you never achieve anything. So I think we should look at the positive right now. Yeah, and I really love the fact that you said step by step, we'll get there. You know, because it is that, right? We'll we'll have to take little steps and and just take action, right? So how do you personally define women's strength in today's world? You know, what does that look like to you? So I think uh, the nice thing about women's strengths today is that they are starting to find their own, uh, their own unique way of being leaders. Whether in the past there was, uh, let's say, trying to be like men, so even to look like men when it comes to the way you dress, the way you behave, the way you voice, the tone of voices. Now I can see that they're more embracing their uniqueness and their femininity when it comes to being leaders or generally speaking, when it comes to look strong. So it's not anymore strong because I raise my voice, strong because I look like a man, it's more strong in my own in my own way. And I found amazing women that, that are also spoke, for example, on our stages when we do big events, or one last year was particularly, I can give you this example, it was particularly impressive because a lot of people loved that speech and was a woman that was um, t- from Salesforce, she's a manager in Salesforce, and she said, uh, you know, I want to share my story as a an introvert leader. Everyone talks about personal branding, how you have to be open all the time and massively sociable for networking to be a leader. But she actually said, no, you can also be a leader being an introvert. And, you know, uh, let's say even with your uniqueness doesn't necessarily mean you can come be a leader. You are just a different leader and maybe even a more empathetic leader in a way. So I think that's that's important to consider different ways of being uh, strong and uh, embracing also uh, diversity, also in terms of uh, attitude and character. Yeah, I love that. And I love the fact that, you know, we're, we're all different and everyone's got a different journey and are different leaders, right, in, in that sense. So let's talk about the importance of having mentors and a support system for women. How big of a role does that play, you know? Were there any mentors in your journey as well that bring, you know, that springs to mind? Absolutely. So mentorship is really, really important. I had mentors throughout my career, uh, especially when I was at Microsoft. You know, large corporations tend to assign to you a mentor, and that's very important. However, the world is not made by all Microsoft. I always say we have to consider all the other type of businesses when maybe it's not that um, you can't find that as often as you should. But reality is it's really, really important. Why is important? I mean, with Women for Impact, we, we have done, we, we actually run a mentorship programs and we are seeing an uptake on people wanting to do that just for the reason that I just told you. So maybe their companies don't allow them to do it, don't organize them themselves. So they try to do that outside on their own terms. And I still see that there is a massive, let's say, benefit that they can find in that. And why is that? It's because the mentor, um, uh, let's say, the mentor is not someone who is telling you what to do, is not your sponsor, so it's not your manager that needs to decide what happens with your career, but might be someone who works together with you uh, on achieving certain goals. And then there is also the coaching, which is uh, probably the, the next stage. But I think before you start a coaching 
let's say, journey or before you take certain decisions, you need to have that in-between moment where you have someone that is actually helping you and understanding what you want to change in your career, where you want to go, what your objectives are and how you can achieve these objectives. So I think it's massively important to have a mentor and as you mentioned also um have in a network in t- um together with you that you know you can um speak about things you can share uh openly about difficulties and challenges and um also ideas you know sometimes i i've seen mentors and mentees um and let's say a building projects together. You know, after six or nine months, we ask the question, "How is going?" Some of them say, "We, we, you know, we finished our journey together. It was great. Thanks." Uh, in other cases, we see people who say, "No, actually, I decided to start this project. She's helping me out, so we'll keep this conversation going." Which is, you know, it's part of is part of the game. But I think it's important. It's important because that person might be the person you are aspiring yourself to. So the person that has, for example, a position that you want to achieve at some point, or might just be a person who maybe is doing something that you are thinking of doing that is not in your own path. And then you can get inspired and she can give you or he can give you, uh, you know, uh, support and um, and advice. And this is what you need. And sometimes it's also an element of self-esteem that you might not have. But if you have someone supporting you, then, you know, it helps you out on that side too. Yeah, it really helps to uh, have someone also to see your potential, right? Because sometimes when you can't see it yourself, it, you know, it's really encouraging and validating in that sense when someone else can see that potential in you to bring something out. Yes. And and I was just wondering if you've um, come across any cool projects or initiatives that are helping women break boundaries and barriers. So I've seen different different type of projects um, in companies. So um, I've seen uh, employee research groups. I've seen internal communities. Um, and I think that helps because, again, these things are happening inside sometimes the company. But, you know, they tend to do events that might have maybe external guests or they are done uh, during lunch, for example, or at the weekends. So I can see more and more the companies creating that kind of environment where people kind of get out from that day-to-day job and they start, you know, working out their soft skills. They start uh, comparing themselves and exchanges, uh, exchanging ideas and projects, you know, with people who are not just the colleagues of their own business unit, if you see what I mean. And and I think that um, uh, stimulates and helps uh, the growth mindset, which at the end of the day, we all need to develop. Yeah. And, and talking about growth mindset, you know, collaboration and being collaborative is, is one of them, right? How can we encourage more collaboration between women from different backgrounds? Uh, That is a tricky one because we know, and this is a bit of a stereotype, but sometimes it is true that um, cooperation between women sometimes is not as easy. It doesn't come as easy and as natural as it comes for men. So what can we do to to help with this this thing? Um, I think having different moments where you actually share, again, your challenges and you know, no filter situation, I call them. No filters where you are really open and honest and, and, and you know, discuss about anything and you don't have to feel judged at that stage because I think that's probably the thing that sometimes stops things because if you feel other people are going to judge you or are going to use your weaknesses against you or they're going to feel that competition that is not a good competition that doesn't help you know doesn't help relationship doesn't help people to to again grow doesn't help people to cooperate and this is actually important also to say that affects the uh, business as well because you know if the groups and the teams we know that uh, if they don't work well together then even the outcomes are not great. So this is why it's becoming more important for companies to help this, um, let's say, cooperation and 
with training, with both training and again, events and situations where people feel that they can share more and they can cooperate more. Things like design thinking, uh, let's say trainings or workshops, or I tried also uh, things with the Lego, I don't know if you know the methodology Lego series play, you know, uh, where people need to be divided in groups and do these workshops where they work together on projects. I think doing uh, those things, not just at um, manager level, but even when people are a bit younger and more junior, I think helps a lot the cooperation because you are cooperating on something that is not a proper business case. It's a business case that is just a game. So there is that element of gamification that I think helps because at the end of the day, is an exercise. This is what I always say, is an exercise. And when people get used to things, then on the day-to-day work, they will apply that, but you need to train them. Yeah, I love the fact that you said the younger, um, you know, the younger employees, right? Those that have just joined, you know, to also maybe go through this kind of training, this kind of workshop, because, you know, I think it's, it's really important to cultivate that sense of collaboration and not competition from the start, you know, because then it's, it becomes a safe space, you know, for, for for individuals to thrive, right? Yeah. And what advice would you give to women um, involved in advocacy and avoiding burnout and maintaining resilience? Yeah, that's That's a huge thing. (laughs) That's a very good question. You know why? Because women tend to be, I believe, at least as my experience was and what I've seen, uh, women tend to get to burn out more quickly because we tend to be more perfectionist. And uh, you might have read statistics where, uh, you know, women seem not even to apply to jobs if they don't have all the requirements that are in the job spec, where men take it more easy and they say, I will try, you know what I mean? So I think we tend to get more burnt out because of that, because we are perfectionist. And also because, again, going back to the previous conversation, We can be mothers, we tend to be those who care about, you know, certain dynamics in the family. Again, this is changing, it's changing a lot, but still there are also different, you know, countries where like Italy, for example, but even Europe in general, probably the US are a bit more, I feel a bit more ahead on that. But again, it depends on where in the US as well, obviously San Francisco, LA and New York are not like other other places. But this is all to say that, it's, it's easy for women to get into this burnout situation for 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 the just for the way we are and for the many many different hats we need to wear. So how do we avoid that? So again, here it comes to a lot of work on yourself. Um, so uh, coaches can help with that, and again, exercising, uh, doing some exercises like. For example, time breaks, you know, if you time break what you need to do and try to focus as much as you can in that particular moment that you have allocated to that specific task and then you have a break and then you start, you know, working on something else, but without without uh, jumping from one thing to another, which is the multitasking thing, which unfortunately doesn't really help and is very, very tiring for you. Uh, the other thing that helps a lot is um, uh, yoga, meditation. So all these things that allow you to be more balanced between your, again, uh, work life. Um, and um, and also I found that uh, helps creativity and helps focus, but in a good way. Mm, so that yeah, I really like that. So just- yeah, I, and, I, and, I, and I love the uh, yoga and meditation because, you know, I, I do yoga and meditation as well. And I find that so helpful in bringing you to the present moment, you know, and, and there's, you know, a study as well that when you think you're not doing anything, that's also when the brain actually, you know, solves problems and, you know, things of other stuff, right? Yes. Thanks for that advice. And I guess, you know, let's talk about bridging the gap between different generations of women. You know, how important is that? Because, you know, for example, like, you know, even talking about burnout and resilience, that looks different to women of different generations, right? You know, our mothers would look at it very differently to how we would look at it. So the gap between uh, different generations is is actually a key thing, uh, especially 
when it comes to, um, let's say, all this new recruitment that will happen and will keep happening and the gens that have completely different way of approaching uh, the way they work, the way they think, you know. Uh, so yeah, I feel it is very important. How do you bridge the gap? Um, one of the things that I found successful is the reverse mentoring. So going back to mentoring, also finding this is something not everybody is doing, but I start to see some companies starting to do some tests and trials. So reverse mentoring meaning is the the young person that actually mentors the older person, because again, there are certain skills that Gen Z can do better than, than my <laughs> generation, for example. And I think, again, uh, how do you bridge the gap? It's just embracing this diversity, but again, making it successful when it comes to work together somehow. Uh, I think it's all uh, the whole roadblocks that are in our minds uh, on that as well. You know, I think if you embrace what the other generation can give you, uh, then then it's, it's a simple game. You feel you are learning, uh, you, sorry, they're learning from you, but you are learning from them as well. That's why I feel that's probably the, the best way to bridge the gap, working together and again, um, ap appreciating the strengths on the boat. But it's not always easy. Yeah, definitely not. And and speaking of roadblocks, you know, are there any roadblocks you see getting in the way of women supporting each other? And how do we tackle those, right? Yeah, so um, I think it's an element of uh, removing, again, competition in a bad way. Competition is good, is great, and should be an engine for, you know, um, for building great things, but you need to find uh, that sisterhood kind of attitude. That means I'm not in competition with you. I am, you know, working with you, and I love to know more about your talent, your strengths, and what makes you unique. And we can work together to build something great. And again, is unfortunately is as easy to say than to do. But uh, my advice is always to um, push yourself further and, you know, work on yourself and say, if you are in a situation where you feel the relationship is not working and you feel there is an element of, you know, competition or, you know, bad vibes and things like that, open, open the conversation, start sharing that, start to find the middle ground that can help you to succeed. Because uh, equally, I've seen situations where when women get together in the good way, they become very, very powerful. So I, I'm a strong believer on relationships between women that can become very, very powerful, but you have to remove certain bias. And again, sometimes it takes time. So it's a continuous learning, continuous work to do everybody needs to do it yeah and there's also like a an element of trust right that needs to be present you know when when uh we're talking about women supporting each other and and i think also you know we we tend to have this idea that competition is is bad but if healthy competition is is you know is present we can grow with that right and what, what advice would you give to young women who are passionate about driving change but may feel a little bit overwhelmed by the scale of the task ahead? So I think the best advice is just uh, go and do it. You know, it's hard. You feel you can't make it, but just go and do it. And this is, uh, I've heard the stories where women might say, I wasn't feeling comfortable on being the only woman in the room. I wasn't feeling comfortable on, you know, being in that meeting, the person having to stand up and show her knowledge because everybody was like, oh, you're not here just to bring copies, right? <laughs> so, but what I always say and what I heard from all these stories is that you need to break uh, that ceiling with yourself first. So if you don't believe in yourself and you don't believe you can make uh, not not everyone else uh, will. So it, it seems a, a very simple thing, but I think it's all about that. Just go and do it. Just break your, your own uh, self-judgment because it's not going to take you anywhere. The more we start standing up and we start speaking up and we start, uh, you know, being leaders in our own way again, the more the world will change. 
But if we keep ourselves in the corner, waiting for someone, somebody else to tell us to stand up, then nothing's going to happen. Yeah. And I come back to what you were saying earlier about taking that first step, right? And step by step, we'll get there. It's just taking action. And so what can listeners do on a daily basis to support women's strength and unity in their own communities and beyond? So in terms of uh, what to do on a daily basis, I mean, reading is very important. Again, podcasts, there are plenty of podcasts where women started to share the, the stories, the way they got there. Also, in terms of, um, let's say, being part of communities, I think helps also to be part of more than one community, right? Because I've seen, um, for example, community about immersive technology, women in immersive technology, right? Or women in crypto space or women in finance. Uh, but I think it's also interesting to to go and tap around in industries that are not necessarily uh, your industry, uh, if you see what I mean. Because I think there is an element of, again, helping your brain to kind of understand also what happens in the different industry and helps you out. Otherwise, we again, we tend to close each other too much in our own industry, in our own bubble. But I think when it comes to network, you should you know, kind of go around and see as much as you can of what is available and get the best from it. I found and I really, my past three years have been great because I met amazing women from many different industries, many different countries. And I felt that that helped me out a lot in terms of, um, in terms of personal growth as well, not only professional. So, but then what was about you know, meeting those other people from different industries. How did that help you, if you don't mind elaborating? Yeah, absolutely. So it helped me to better understand, for example, what are the different challenges that they face? Because, um, you know, I worked in, in tech most of my career, uh, but I found out that in finance, for example, or in lawyers, a kind of area that have different, you know, problems, different dynamics. And, you know, it was good to share that sometimes the things were the same, just different contexts, but sometimes it was, um, it was just a different way of looking at things and, uh, also opened up conversations about why we don't have enough women in data, for example, why we don't have enough women in physics or mathematics. You know, it brings up conversation about what can we do to make sure that in the future, you know, this will happen. Because if you go to the universities, first year, most cases, if you go to physics and mathematics, at least in Europe, you find mainly men. And, and we're like, um, we, we started this conversation about why is that? I mean, it's real that women are not interested in, in, enough in finance or enough in AI or enough in the good, uh, in the new things, new technologies, or it's just an element of, again, bias and not being able to really let's say, embrace our talents since we're very young. And I think those are conversations, very interesting conversations to have because the moment we'll be mothers or, you know, we will deal with the new people in our teams that are young, we know that there is that thing and we know that we can help them maybe to choose a career path or to feel less uh, uncomfortable in choosing that path, for example. And I think if uh, until you speak to people and you really understand that this thing exists and that re reality, maybe you read an article and you're like, oh, yeah, OK, but it's different when you hear it from from people who are experienced. Yeah, because you already know what you know, right? Yeah, <laughs> you know, and by having these conversations, you get to understand the different cultures, the different, you know, personalities as well. So before we wrap things up, um, is there anything you'd like to share as a final thought, maybe? Or if there's anything that we've missed out that you feel, you know, is important to share? Yeah. So I think uh, considering the space where you operating and as Diana knows, I also run a, a conference about crypto in uh, in it, the crypto blockchain in Italy and uh, I've been in situations where we were probably 10 women <laughs> so I think the the last thing to say to your audience is let's again bring more women in this industry as well because I think it's fascinating there are plenty of new jobs that 
you know, uh, uh, actually racing in Web3. And I hope to see more and more, more women leading companies in this space. Amazing. Where can our listeners find you? Like Everywhere. on Twitter, on... Okay. And they were LinkedIn, uh, definitely LinkedIn, uh, Instagram, and uh, Twitter, TikTok, and YouTube. So (laughs) that's a lot. (laughs) You are everywhere. (laughs) Amazing. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation to be a guest on our podcast. Um, We're really grateful for, you know, uh, your valuable contributions and insights. It was a real pleasure having you and having this conversation with you. My pleasure. Thank you so much. And I hope that would be helpful for many, many women. Yeah, thank you. And to you, our dear listeners, I hope you've enjoyed the conversation. Don't forget to like, subscribe and share this episode. Thanks for tuning in and see you next time.